Okay, great. Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction um, and thanks for the opportunity to pre present our work here. So in human communication, <clears throat> one of the most important features is to understand what is said. Um, and I will call this speech recognition in the following. We can recognize what is said from the auditory modality, which I present here as a, a spectrogram. And we can also recognize speech from the visual modality, as you can see in this video. In our models um, on how we think about how speech is processed in the brain, we often focus very much on the cerebral cortex. And this view implicitly assumes that the auditory and the visual sensory pathways are just input structure to the cerebral cortex, which then does the interesting analysis parts of, uh, for, for speech recognition. But this view leaves several findings unexplained. Uh, so we know for a long time that there are massive feedback connections from the cerebral cortex to um, the sensory pathway nuclei. And we know that these sensory pathway nuclei have um, complex field, receptive field properties that can change over time. So why should such a system not be used to, to analyze speech, um, which is one of the most complex and most dynamic, dynamic stimuli that the brain has to analyze? And this is especially uh, interesting, um, I think, because a long time we know that there are post-mortem histological alterations of sensory thalamus in developmental dyslexia, which is a disorder that has difficulties in perceiving speech sounds. So um, our general working hypothesis in, in this uh, field of research is that feedback mechanisms are used for speech recognition. And uh, this, um, so feedback mechanisms to the sensory pathway nuclei. Um, this hypothesis requires um, like five years worth of experiments. And in this talk, I would like to show you two examples of our work on this. But before I start with the experiments, just a very quick overview of the sensory pathways in the auditory and visual modality. I will be talking about the MGB, um, the auditory thalamus, the inferior colliculus, um, the auditory midbrain, and I also briefly mentioned the visual um, thalamus, the LGM. So an indication um, that the sensory uh, pathway nuclei are specifically involved in speech came from this kind of design, which we performed in a 3T um, uh, um, MRI scanner. Um, subjects were listening to sequences of um, syllables, which were spoken by different speakers. And they had two different tasks. The first one was a syllable task, where they did a one back judgment on whether the syllable that they just heard was the same or different from the immediately preceding syllable. And the other task was a speaker task, where subjects were judging whether the speaker was different or the same from the speaker of the previous syllable. So if we assume that um, the sensory pathway nuclei just pro, uh, provide bottom-up information to the cerebral cortex, we would not expect that um, there will be differences between the syllable and the speaker task in the activation in these nuclei. But what we found is that actually the syllable task um, leads to higher responses here in the auditory thalamus um, than, the, than the speaker task. I will call this task-dependent modulation for speech uh, in the following. This task-dependent modulation for speech, which I plot here, um, is related to the, about the speech recognition scores across subjects. So the better the people are in recognizing auditory speech, uh, the higher is the task-dependent modulation in the left medial geniculate body. This has been repli replicated by uh, several experiments, and we also um, find similar modulation for visual speech recognition in the visual thalamus, the LGM. So a uh, quick intermediate summary. So there's a task-dependent mod modulation of sensory thalamus for speech recognition. So one question is, of course, how do we explain this? What is the computational mechanism behind it? And our working model currently is this one. We assume that there is a predictive coding going on between cerebral cortex and sensory thalamus, where the cerebral cortex provides predictions about the um, possible speech trajectory to the sensory thalamus to facilitate processing um, of, of the auditory signals. And we assume that this is a very dynamic 
thing that there are um, really recurrent loops going on between these structures. And that this is especially important if we have to analyze fast varying stimuli, such as when we want to recognize syllables, where we really have to track the trajectories of the speech signal here, indicate performance to perform the task. While, for example, in the speaker task, we just need to compute the summary statistics um, and, and can recognize differences in the speaker. So if this model is correct, we would expect that, cortical, uh, that um, sensory thalamus responses can be explained by a predictive coding mechanism. And this is um, what we tested in the next um, experiment. Um, so this was an oddball design. We performed this in a seven Tesla um, MRI with a high um, spatial resolution of 1.5 millimeter isotropic. Participants were listening to these um, sounds. These were different of different frequencies. It was pure tones. There were the so-called standards, which were repeating tones. And then once in a while, there was a deviant, which was differing in frequency from the standards. These deviants could occur at, at um, three different positions. Um, this is the deviant in position four. They could also occur at position five and six of the sequence. And the participant's task was to report as accurately and quickly as possible the, uh, the location of the deviant. Um, there are opposing hypotheses on how to explain the computational mechanisms of responses in the sensory nuclei um, to these deviants. So in the, uh, if we assume that these sensory pathway nuclei habituate to the standards uh, and, and show restored responses to the deviants, we would expect that um, for the different deviant positions here in four, five, and six, the, uh, there is no uh, difference in the height of the responses to the to the standard uh, to the deviant. While if we have a predictive coding view, we would expect um, that the amount of response to the deviant scales with the probability of the deviant occurring. So um, here the prob probability is one third. Here the probability is half, and here the probability is one. And accordingly, we expect that the responses of the sensory nuclei are different between the different deviant positions. So to summarize, for the different deviant positions, we expect the similar uh, responses if we assume that they uh, that sensory pathway nuclei correspond to a habituation uh, view, while we expect differences uh, between the deviants um, in the predictive coding view. And here um, I show you the experimental results. Um, these are the summary responses in our regions of interest, which were bilateral NGB and um, inferior colliculus. These are the responses, the bold responses in the median geniculate um, body. And um, here, um, the differences between the deviant four, five, and six positions. And as you can already see here, there are significant differences between the deviants. And this is the case for the left and the right side, as well as for the inferior colliculus of the left and the right. So um, these results are already indicate um, that the habituation view is not correct to explain these um, to explain these results. To more formally test this, we performed a Bayesian model comparison of these um, responses, and we defined two models: one the habituation model and one the predictive coding model, which make um, different predictions as I already um, said, to how much they respond to the different deviant positions as well to less expected standards. So, and these are the results. The, this is the medial geniculate body, and this is the inferior colliculus. And the uh, more red it is, the higher is the um, posterior for the prediction model. And as you can see here, that there are large parts of the medial geniculate body and even more of the inferior colliculus um, that respond can be explained by the predictive coding model. So to summarize this part, um, the sensory thalamus, the MGP, and the midframe ICU uses predictive coding for information transfer.
And with that, I would like to thank uh, my group, um, especially uh, Alejandro Tabas, who has done the 7T experiment on, um, uh, on the prediction, um, as well as Glad Mihai and Begonia Diaz, who has done um, work on task dependent modulation by speech of medial geniculate body and LGN. Um, I would like to thank our collaborators, funding organizations, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Katharina. That was pretty cool. Um, if there are questions from the panelists, please unmute and participate. If not, I have, well, I have a question. Um, you know, in the, in the visual system and just in general, how I think about predictive coding hypotheses in the brain, uh, I think of them as segregating processing streams where the visual thalamus at least is thought to be this sort of protected nucleus, nucleus that um, handles mainly pure bottom-up sensory input. And here clearly you're, you're showing predictive processing um, in subcortical regions below the cortex. Do you think that this is uh, particular to the auditory system or do you think it generalizes and we just need to sort of look better and design more clever tasks? Mm. Yes, um, I mean, I think that it's um, generalizable. Um, we only currently have results for that um, uh, in, in the speech part. So we know that there's top-down modulation of the LGN when people recognize speech. And I would assume, I mean, our hypothesis is that this is because they use predictive coding already at this uh, point uh, in the hierarchy. And what I think is that, I mean, look better, yeah. I, I think that uh, you, or we often just see these kind of responses if it's behaviorally relevant. Because if it's not, then, I mean, yeah. why should the brain then use predictive coding and modulate responses? There's no need for it. And I think that's, that's something that, that is uh, sometimes maybe underestimated on how important it is uh, to really have a relevant task to reveal these kinds of uh, responses. That's fair enough. That's a good point. Okay, we have, uh, we have time for one more question. Um, could the 7T fMRI signal be optimized even further to look even earlier in the ascending auditory pathway? <laughs> yes, thank you for this question. Exactly. So, we, um, um, yeah, I mean, we look now at the mediogenic lip body and the inferior colliculus because they are, I mean, they are still challenging to image uh, in humans in vivo, but uh, yeah, one can do it. Um, we are currently trying to optimize the designs to also image the cochlear nucleus. Okay, great. Uh, I have more questions, but we're running a little behind. Thank you, Katharina. Thank you, Agnes. And thank you, David. Thank you, Sophia, for running the tech and to everyone in the audience for participating. This was a really great session, guys. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Oh, bye, -bye. Thank you.